Well, last week we did one one review of the uh, Asia Week results, and uh, there were, I wanted to come back this week, as I as I said, and and go through uh, several other sales that took place in New York, uh, that, because I, I think they were very interesting. I think the results were strong, and I I, uh, I, I think we got a, a, a pretty good uh, sense of where the market is at the moment, uh, given all that's going on in the world. Uh, uh, you know, f foreign relations sort of not at the best they've ever been, and. And whatnot, and I think we're we're seeing uh, indications that a lot of folks, uh, Chinese art collectors, uh, there was some concern that they might be backing away. And I think instead, what we're seeing is that a lot of them are ones with money are doubling down and and putting their putting their money into hard assets, um, such as art. And uh, this is not a, an enormous surprise. It, hap it happens uh, uh, from time to time. But I think this is what we're seeing now. They're getting very selective. But the very best pieces that have been off the market, and we're going to see this throughout all of these results pretty much, if they've been off the market for any length of time, um, uh, g get a very warm welcome when they're put up for auction again. And uh, we're going to take a walk through and, and, and look at a few things. We're going to start over at Sotheby's. And this was in their important Chinese works of art sale. Was this? It was a pair of uh, Kangxi Markin period birthday dishes, and these, uh, according to court records, were made uh, for his 60th birthday in 1713. Um, there's a fair bit written about them and so forth. They've been well documented over the years. And this pair last appeared on the auction market in 1989, a long time ago. And I don't know what they brought. I, I, I didn't I didn't actually go and try to look it up, but I'm gonna bet they brought five to six thousand dollars or something like that, four to seven thousand. And um, this time around they were estimated at eight to twelve thousand and sold for thirty seven thousand eight hundred dollars. Uh, 300% of their high estimate, basically. So that gives you some idea where, where the market is right now, but they were in beautiful condition. They haven't been on the market in a long time and they're tied to the Emperor Kangxi's birthday. So it, it's sort of a trifecta there and it's a, it's a, a, a very desirable combination among collectors. And um, they, have the, they have the provenance on them um, going back to, uh, they were sold in 1978. They were to the T.Y. Chow collection, which was one of the great, great, great Chinese art collections of the 20th century. And um, he died in 1999. And then they, they were sold, these were sold, as I said, at Christie's in 1989. All right, and then moseying along over to this. If you're a jade buyer, I hope you saw this. This uh, had a, a very low estimate. I'm not quite sure why. I think they may have pushed for it to make sure that it does sell. And uh, this was an extremely rare yellow jade, yellow nephrite jade. Yellow nephrite jade is, is among the rarest of all the jade colors. It's much rarer than, than, than white, greenish white, dark green, and all that. This is, this is a color that uh, uh, real jade fans go after. And what's interesting about this, it has an art, it's based on a, the carving was done in the form of an archaic bronze, and then had these, these wave devices uh, lapping around the base and so forth. And this this isn't a great big bronze. This thing is, uh, what, six and a half inches tall. But it was estimated at sixty to $80,000 and ended up selling for $239,400. Absolutely blew the high estimate away. And again, it's because it's rare. Um, here's another shot of it from the other side. It's absolutely beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, warm yellow color. And uh, the, the striations of, of it within the stone, these brown or tan striations, were used nicely. Um, uh, by the carver, uh, incorporating them into into the overall composition. Beautiful job, all carved from a single piece of jade. And here you have this 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 sort of wave business, and then this this dragon's mask on the bottom, biting on, wrapping his jaws around the base of the of the of the bronze, um, uh, the vessel. And uh, it's a very attractive little ewer, and had a lot of interest, obviously. And then over to this was this uh, Sha late Shang Dynasty goo form vase. It's a famous style of vase. You've all seen them before. It's a vit ritual wine vessel. And uh, this one was particularly nice because of the crispness of the casting. The crispness of the casting, very even smooth patina, highly desirable. The, just look at this and how, how, how even the patina is from top to bottom. You don't see, you know, when you see a lot of the copies floating around today, you see these bright green spots bearing. And those can occur on, in, in some old bronzes, but, but this surface is the surface you really want. This even greenish uh, tone uh, just, just uh, you know, encasing the, the, the whole body 
and b beautifully, beautifully done. Uh, it was estimated at eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand, um, uh, and it ended up bringing four hundred and seventy-eight thousand dollars. And this is not a terribly big bronze either. It's about twelve or twelve and a half inches tall, but uh, the quality of it was absolutely excellent. And uh, uh, last time it was on the market. Um, it was in the uh, Fanyan C collection um, uh, 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 who died in 1905 and it's been in a private European collection ever since. So for 115 years, 116 years, this has been in a private collection, hasn't been on the market and um, the, the, the bidders responded accordingly. Uh, $478,000, which is a very strong price for a goo, but uh, this was a really, really good one. So. Um, Bravo. And then on to this. This was the cover lot of the catalog, actually. It was this really nice Western Zhao bronze. Guo Zhi Shi Zi Zhu Hu. Hu form vase. And the rest of it is, is about, the, about the design. And what's interesting is that this particular design, even though it, it was an 8th century BC Western Zhao uh, thing, in the 18th century, the, uh, in, during the Qinlung period, uh, they made copies of this almost identically, uh, but done in porcelain. And they did them um, in, in underglazed blue. They did them in underglazed blue with enamels and all this for the Emperor Qinlong. He was an, he was absolutely uh, uh, crazy about early bronzes, Shang bronzes, Western Zhao bronzes, Han bronzes. Um, he spent a lot of time studying them. He spent a lot of time inventorying the palace the bronze collection personally, just like he did with rhino horns. He, he really was a hand-on emperor. And... Um, this particular uh, type of bronze, uh, everybody recognized that he was really fond of it, this one. And uh, the porcelain makers in Jing Deshen um, uh, uh, began producing um, porcelain copies for him, just to please him, just to make him a happy guy. Don't want the emperor unhappy. And how big was it? 16 inches tall. It's got, uh, it had an extensive provenance. And again, um, uh, hadn't been on the uh, market since 1940. According to this, uh, it's been in a private American collection since since then. It had belonged to Zhao An before that. There's a whole history of it going back, and according to the the, the history of the piece, um, it was it, it was discovered in Shanxi Province in the Qing Dynasty, and um, uh, uh, by repute during the Qinlung period. So this this thing has been a known commodity for a long time. It's been floating around. It's been in private collections. It's been off the market forever came back with an $800,000 to $1.2 million estimate, ended up selling for $2,107,000. It's quite a, quite a piece, but it's got an interesting history. It's, 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 it's been, as I said, again, off the market for a long time, and uh, uh, a familiar face as far as its form and type because they made, the, they made porcelain examples um, of this during the Qinlung period, which are also highly valued. All right, and then along to this, this early Western Zhao um, uh, Zun vase, or ritual, it's a wine ritual vase, not terribly big, 10 inches tall. And uh, this is an interesting thing. The last time it was, um, let's see here, the last time it was on the market uh, was in September 11th, September of 2011. It was lot 298 at a Sotheby's sale. And I, last week I wondered how it would do because it's only been off the market for about 10 years. And sometimes when things are off the market for a few years, then come back onto the market, you, there, there, are, there are certain pieces, we've all seen them, that turn up at the major auction houses fairly cyclically. You know, every four or five years they come to auction, they come to auction, they come. And um, this, this one was 10 years out, and I was, a little bit, what, I was wondering a little bit how it would do. And uh, in the end, it did fine. It brought $705,000, won $100,000 over its high estimate. When all This includes the, the buyer's premium and all that, of course. And the buyer's premium is you know, 25 30%. So it adds quite a bit onto the purchase price. But that is the purchase price. So it was estimated at four to 600000 But it had a wonderful surface, had a nice old patina on it. Um, uh, a nice natural patina. It's undisturbed, clean, and... Uh, uh, the crowd loved it, and uh, off it went. And then on to this, the uh, uh, B.I. Zong uh, Markin period, Kangxi period uh, 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 bell. And it was also done uh, on his 57th, 52nd year in, in uh, power, but uh, 
on his 60th birthday, 1713 again. This is something you're gonna you're gonna see over and over with the Kangxi Emperor and other emperors. There seems to be a, 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 an increased output of art uh, around their 60th birthday if they're still in power at that time. And this is a, a, a very attractive bell. And these bells were made in sets and they were hung on wooden racks and they all let off different tones and there was the, the, there was a, a, a panel of bells that were yang tones and yin tones basically and the uh the creature on the top is interesting because this, these are known as pu lao pu lus and they were dragons that through through uh, in, in mythology lived on the shoreline at the edge of the ocean and they were there um, sort of vigilantly guarding and keeping an eye out for their enemy, which, was, which were whales for some reason. I don't know why whales are anybody's enemy, but back then they, the, the dragons viewed the whales as enemies. And uh, if the uh, whales approached shore, the, the, these dragons would roar and, and get ferocious and so forth to, to ward off the uh, whales. And uh, it's, it's sort of a funny story. But at any rate, this bell was, was a great one. Uh, it had a very, very good surface, inscribed, of course, and all that business. And uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit written about them. If you're interested in these bells, look it up. But uh, it was estimated at 80 to 120,000. Ended up selling for $327,000. And uh, had, had a pretty good provenance. And it, was, it, was, it came from the collection of James Bynes. Um, uh, uh, he died in 1987. And it was gifted to the current owner in the 70s. And they've had it ever since. It doesn't say who they were. And they decided to sell it, or their heirs decided to sell it. And um, th there you go. And these are, how big is this one? This one's 11, 11 inches tall. 11 inches tall. They're not, some of the bells are quite a bit bigger than that. Some of them are, I think, 16 to 18 inches. They get quite large. But uh, this was a, a sort of a mid-range one. And uh, beautifully cast, in good condition, and <clears throat> with extensive ownership history, which is really important. And then on to this, one of the main events was this uh, absolutely fascinating uh, a dice bowl uh, uh, from the Shundi period. And, um, uh, and not only is this bowl extremely rare um, and beautifully potted um, and beautifully decorated uh, uh, all the way around, but the, owner, the owners of the bowl, the, the Americans who ended up owning this bowl and how they came to own it is just as interesting almost as the bowl itself. Um, but one of the things that we saw in Xuandi porcelains was that the uh, um, uh, Xuandi emperor was, uh, was a big supporter of the arts. He was sort of, uh, you know, Qinlong and later on uh, sort of took a lot of the same approaches that the Xuandi emperor took. And he wanted to uh, encourage the arts and encourage the technology in the arts and so forth. And during this period, they, they did a lot of work researching and experimenting and mastering the application of cobalt so they could better control it. Because you got to remember that they, it was only during the Yuan dynasty that they began using it to create patterns and designs. And then Zhuangdi came shortly thereafter. And he, he, he felt that they, they, they could maybe do it a little better, make it a little more refined. And that's what they did here. And if you examine the dragon on this thing, he is meticulously done absolutely meticulously done with, with interesting um, uh, bits of shading that you don't often see. Um, the, the facial expression of the dragon, the claws, the arms, the muscularness of the arms coming down on the dragon, all beautifully done and, uh, and marked on the interior. And this was estimated at six to $800,000, which is a pretty strong price. Ended up selling for 1.2 million and the bowl measured about 10 inches in diameter. But what was really interesting about this, you, you have to go down and, and read the story of it. It was in the collection of Leon and Max Friedman. And these were a couple of guys that, that were brought to America as children from Romania. And uh, they ended up going into the, uh, initially into the aeronautics business. They, they, they threw into a thing that was called the Aerodome or the Motor Dome. And they would hire stunt pilots the way they would and travel around the and put on aerial shows, stunt shows for everybody. And they originally got started actually working with the Wright brothers before that. But they went into the, this, this aerial uh, flight business and one of their first pilots was a Chinese gentleman who came to work for them. They became his friend. And uh, he actually later went back to China and in, in the, around 1920 or so and taught the, uh, the, during the Republic period and helped the Chinese start their first air force. Uh, but in any event, these guys had this this flying flying circus business going on, and then they decided to go to China. And when they got to China, they recognized that the automobile was becoming as big a thing over there as it was over here. They made a deal with Chrysler Corporation, and they became, I think, the largest foreign dealer 
of American cars uh, in the world from the from around 1920s and 30s, 1930s, 1920s and 30s up to up to 1940 when things started to fall apart with the war and all the turmoil they went through and then they left and came back to America. But they were fabulously successful. They lived in Shanghai and they bought this bowl. And one of the brothers died, uh, he died in 1942, uh, shortly after returning to America. And his uh, other brother uh, lived until early 1960, 61, 1962, something like that. But they had an absolutely amazing life. And um, we're in China at some real uh, historic uh, moments, pivotal moments in Chinese history. Um, they had a great relationship um, um, uh, with, 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 the, with the Chinese uh, government at the time. And they were interestingly on the, both of them involved heavily in two cutting edge industries, which was the aeronautics industry and the automobile industry. And they're more or less in their infancies. And, uh, uh, and along the way, they, they developed some taste and bought a wonderful bowl. And it was passed down through the family. Uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was acquired in China between 1920 and 1940. They're not sure when exactly. And thence by descent within the family, the descendants had this. And I suspect somebody said, hey, I wonder what that old bowl is worth these days from, from Uncle Max and uh, her grandpa Max. And uh, they decided to sell it and it did absolutely great. And uh, these bowls don't turn up very often, but this was a really fine one with an interesting story. So there you go. All right, and then along to this, this very rare Ming type. The pattern is Ming style, but the form of the vase, the Mei Ping and so forth, the way it's done, this is a, a, a Qinlong example, Mark and period. Um, a very, very rare type. They don't turn up very often on the market. So they can be a little bit tricky to, um, uh, to date. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, not to date, but to, to estimate. This one was acquired, uh, the only history on it was acquired um, in Los Angeles in the 1960s and has, has been in fenced by descent within the family. But what really got things going was was that it is extremely similar to one from the ET, from the Chow, the famous Chow collection that sold um, back in the 1980s. They had a vase like this, um, and they don't turn up often. They're, they're, they're some, the Palace Museum has them. The National Palace Museum has them. The uh, um, I think the Metropolitan Museum in New York has one. The British Museum probably has one. That's about it. Um, there's a few in private collections, but they're they're very rare birds, and uh, measuring around 12 inches, 12 and three quarter inches tall, estimated at four to six hundred thousand, and ended up selling for eight hundred and forty four thousand dollars. But if you look at this thing carefully, um, you notice that the, the decoration is is done very much in the Ming style with that heaping and piling effect that we hear so much about. But the cobalt quality is just absolutely superb. The drawing is outstanding. And you'll notice how the body is this very, 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 very um, a low gloss white body with the flowers painted onto them. So they look like they're floating. They, they, have, a, they have a very decided floating effect on the porcelain, which was which is beautiful. And then these beautiful uh, acanthus leaves or bok choy leaves wrapping the base done with incredible precision all the way around. And uh, just a, an absolutely beautiful piece of porcelain. It's an absolute work of art. And uh, it did very well. It did very, very well. All right. And then on to this. We talked about this last week because I thought this was wonderful. And I thought the estimate was low. Um, and it was. Uh, but it, a very rare type of a Qinlong vase. And it had a hole in the bottom. Um, this is the thing that is really great. And last week, when we talked about it before, it was speculated that it probably would do much better than the estimate because the form is so rare and it is so beautifully enameled all the way up. Just a splendid, splendid example with all this uh, reticulated uh, work of this lattice passage. Here you have the, the uh, sort of interlocking cat coin symbols here. Then you have this, this lattice, uh, like a balustrade uh, uh, panel, like a lattice that you see around a balustrade. And then at the top, this cross hatching, and uh, the wonderful soft, slightly yellowish green uh, uh, background color, and then done in uh, uh, Famille Rose over it with these brown glazed foo lines, very very elaborate turquoise pendants hanging from their mouths, just absolutely absolutely great. And uh, the only history of this uh, provenance is a private New York collection. That's it. No history from when they got it or anything. And as I mentioned last week, they had a big old hole right in the bottom. Um, there it is, drilled right through. <laughs> so somebody uh, obviously made this into a table lamp probably in the 1920s. 
and, uh, and it got passed along down to a family. There's an extensive, there's a pretty extensive write-up on the piece here about uh, similar examples done in this manner that are in the Beijing Museum and so forth. It's worth reading. But as I said, it was estimated at fifty to seventy thousand uh, dollars, which seemed very reasonable, and um, uh, it ended up selling for seven hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, so, the, so, so much for estimates. So, ten times its high estimate. All right, and that was sort of how it went at Sotheby's. They had a few things that didn't sell. They always, you always do. It's part of the game. But uh, overall, the the things that had interesting history, interesting provenance, and ex extremely high quality, and they haven't been on the market in a while, um, uniformly all do just great. They all do fine. All right, and one of the things I wanted to mention. This was something I came across this morning. I want to include this was that uh, Christie's tomorrow is having a, uh, an Islamic sale. And uh, this is something that uh, absolutely uh, I absolutely loved. It's a, it's a very rare Sevafid um, silk and metal thread Polonaise carpet. And uh, if, you, if you don't know much of it, these were made in Isfahan. And if you live in America, unfortunately, you can't bid on it because of the embargo. They won't let you even register to bid on this because you can't legally ship it into the United States because it was technically made in Iran. And we're on the outs right now with Iran until they figure out what we're going to What a mess. I'm not going to go into it, but it's a fiasco. Um, but anyway, this beautiful, beautiful carpet with an amazing history of ownership. Uh, this had, had come down, um, uh, uh, it had been in the Rothschild collection in the 19th century. And there's a, a fascinating long history of these what are known as Polonaise carpets. And uh, even though they're raised, uh, even though they were all woven in Iran, um, they became huge, uh, hugely popular among the royal families of Poland. Polish royal court used to order these. They they ordered carpets um, from from Iran that would have uh, uh, the family crest on them and all this kind of thing. In the 1870s, um, when they did the Paris exhibition, the Polish government, the country of Poland, had a big booth there, and they sent a bunch of these rugs. Just not they weren't they didn't say they were made in Poland. They just said these are wonderful products from you know that we have in our royal collection, beautiful pieces, and they they displayed them and everybody just assumed they were all made in Poland during the exhibition. And then after the exhibition ended, they announced, no, 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 these, these were made in Iran for us. We had people weave these. And uh, because of that, that exhibition, they were, became known as Pol Polonaise carpets. And they, they had nothing to do with Poland, but the, everybody just assumed it, and the French labeled it the way they do Blanc de Chien and <laughs> Femme Ver, and those become the accepted term. So the, the French uh, press labeled these Polonaise carpets. And uh, uh, um, here you go. And this is a, an absolutely splendid example. Some of these that are around, around um, are, are considered to be not anywhere near as good as this one. This is a great one. And uh, it's estimated at um, 1 million pounds to 1.5 million pounds, which is a, a, a pretty, uh, a, Amazing, and according to the provenance on here, uh, it was it was the, the, the history. It was sold by Adolf Karl von Rothschild, who died in, in 1900, and it was passed along uh, to Maurice de Rothschild, his son or nephew. I'm not sure which. He died in the 50s, and it was bought by the Gallery Rosenberg and Steibel, which was one of the great uh, art textile companies in the world in 1970, and it was sold to a German family, and it's been in their collection since 1970 hasn't been on the market since. So I, I'm just throwing this as an aside because it's a, just a beautiful piece of uh, textile and um, um, we'll see how it does. Uh, so I'll, I'll check back tomorrow and see how it, did, how it did. Maybe it won't sell, who knows? You never know with textiles. And then moseying along over here into uh, Chinese important works of art at Christie's. And uh, they had a good sale. They had some very good silks, as you can see, some really fine rank badges. Uh, I think all of them sold, I think, as far as I, I, I recall. Um, oh, one, one silk didn't sell, this embroidery, but all the rank badges sold. Absolutely uh, great quality, beautifully curated. There was some good Chinese export pieces and so on. We're going to go through. I'm going to go through a couple of the lots that I, I liked in particular. One of them was this, this large mottled black and brown jade kong. Very very rustic looking and uh, it had a modest estimate for some reason six to eight thousand dollars but as we saw with the other kong the green kong the section that sold 
and it sold. It was estimated six to eight thousand sold for over two hundred and two hundred thirty thousand last week. Two hundred forty thousand. Um, again, another Kong um, uh, given uh, from the Neolithic period, given a low estimate, and ended up selling for more than ten times its high estimate. But the surface on this uh, stone was just great, beautiful, beautiful um, patina to the jade uh, from age. Just uh, beautifully, beautifully done, beautiful colors. And uh, had a few nicks out of it, of course, but um, wonderful example. And uh, as I said, $90, $94,500. And then on to this, the Han Fangu, a Warring States period bronze, very big, 16 and three quarter inches tall. Uh, in the provenance, uh, all they know is that it was sold by Kokoto, um, in New York before 1996. Um, that's all they, they really have to say on it. It was estimated at four to six hundred thousand and it, it went through and it brought two million seven hundred and sixty thousand and, and no change. Okay, that was it. And uh, this was a wonderful bronze. If you took the time to look at it and you blow it up, um, these Han bronzes like this, they, they told stories. They had all kinds of imagery on here. And if you look here, you have a fellow in a chariot with a, with a banner behind him going along and you have this interior scene, a terrace scene, and down here you have um, uh, uh, people working, leading their horses, soldiers, and then tiger skins below it and all this. There's a lot of imagery on these bronzes, which is one of the reasons why they get so much attention, they do so well. And uh, there's some nice natural verdigris uh, 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 green popping through on it, um, uh, in, in, a little bit here and there, not a lot of it, but the, the, whole, the surface of it appears to be all undisturbed. And uh, $2,700,000 was the final price. Uh, so the, we, there, was, there was another one that, uh, I'm not sure if Christie's had it or Sotheby's had it, but there was another similar example that went through um, just a few years ago with these Han bronzes. And I think it brought a, about $2 million also. So that seems to be the trend. And then on to this, this Shang Dynasty, Ian Yang um, uh, uh, era uh, uh, bronze. And uh, 12th, 12th, 11th century BC, estimated 100 to 150 thousand, ended up selling for 819 thousand dollars. It did great, but uh, again, you have the the history of the provenance, um, important private collection uh, prior to 1994, and then by descent within the family, and uh, it was sold. Uh, the last time it was on the market was in 1961, a right, long time ago. But what it had really going for it was. Um, the surface. Uh, well, one, the casting quality was absolutely superb. Uh, if you look at the finish and the edges and the surface on this, the surface and color, the green, just beautiful, just absolutely beautifully kept for, for a piece that's a couple thousand years old. Castings were broad and crisp, and this lobed form body was one that was, was, was really begun during this period. And uh, no one's ever messed with the patina on this, which is, they used to do that sometimes in the early 20th century. They get these bronzes and they would scrape the, scrape the surfaces off thinking that they would look, if they could make them look newer, they'd be more valuable to Western buyers. But uh, this, this was a splendid, splendid bronze and uh, did very well. It brought $819,000. And uh, hop over here to this, the Lung Kwan Celadon Southern Sung Sensor. And I'm showing this because th there are, thousands and thousands of copies of these floating around in the auction market and if you go to invaluable or live auctioneers or any one of these these selling sites um you, you're going to always find one of these on there it seems every week you're going to find several all right they are very rare they do not turn up often they were first made in the southern sung period and they continued making them on to the yuan dynasty at long Kwan, and they were sent out as gifts they were they, they were very popular among japanese collectors uh, there was a famous shipwreck that uh, uh, there was he heading from China to Japan that went down with a whole bunch of these on board that they they recovered at one point, but they all have underwater damage to them. But it was I, they were stunned, I guess, on how many copies, uh, how many of these uh, not copies, but how many of these sensors were on there. But they turn up so often. I wanted to show this one, and um, and, and just r sort of a reminder everybody that when, you, when you're looking around at all these other sites and you see them in there with eight to twelve hundred dollar estimates and Fifteen hundred to twenty-five hundred dollar estimates. They're they 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 are copies. Um, um, Ninety-nine point nine nine percent of the time. All right. This is a real. This was a real one. Obviously, estimated at sixty to eighty thousand, 
sold for $226,800. It was in excellent condition. It had no cracks or chips to it. The surface looked good. The glaze was right, wonderful. And it had this greenish color that uh, Japanese collectors uh, back around in the 19th century and before and, and after absolutely loved. And um, um, here is a good look at it. And you can, you can go over pull it up go over it and I, and I can't say it often enough but when you when you when you when you're looking on these sites and you see these great photographs that they provide and if you're interested in an area create a folder on your computer and download these images and the information with them and, and create your own little archives it will be extremely handy going ahead all right now on to this this is a I jump down like that. N another great piece, a Northern Jun, uh, Northern Sungta Jin Dynasty um, uh, uh, Jun Purple Splash Bottle Vase. And these are rare. The, the authentic ones of these are very, very rare. As you can see by the price realized, it was estimated at three to 500,000 and sold for 882,000. And the, one of the reasons these are so rare is that the coloring um, was very hard to do. And they did it by applying um, uh, copper oxide to the body and then firing it and getting it to flash red the, the way copper oxide will do given the, the right environment and the firing. If it goes wrong, if the firing goes badly, it'll turn green on you. But uh, if you've done, it, done well, you get the, these wonderful flashes of color that come down over the body. And th this is why, especially for Northern Sung to Yuan, um, finding and, and finding this color um, uh, was, is a, is a, was, a, it was a real achievement for the Sung potters to be able to do this. Uh, you have to realize they didn't have thermometers and they had to very carefully using feel and eyes determine is the temperature okay to fire because if it got too hot or it got too cold, didn't reduce the atmosphere properly, this all turns to rubbish. So um, it was quite a skill, and these these guys sat by these kilns for days while the while the por porcelain and the pots were being fired to maintain the temperature and using little eye vents to look inside. You just you can't imagine how hard that was. Um, but at any rate, this this was a highly desirable form. This, they have examples in the in the in the in the palace museum. They have examples in the British Museum, and then this one. Everybody went after it, and uh, eight hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars. And uh, it was in the J.M. Hu collection, um, um, uh, Zandi Lu collection, and, and Zandi Lu collection um, uh, in 19, up till 1995. And then um, uh, there's again literature in the Edward Chow collection about this about this uh, type of thing. And um, again, not on the market every other month, and did just great. All right, and then we get over here to this. There are two. There were two very good young low, um, uh, porcelains in, in 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 the sale, and there was this one with the vines and um, uh, they look like almost like hibiscus flowers floating around it. Um, let's see, floral sprays. Da, 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 da. What's the history of this thing? Uh, the last time it was on the market was uh, 23 years ago at Christie's uh, New York in March of 1997. And uh, this, these kind of plates were, the, the young low plates were found not only in China and India and all that, they were found in the Middle East at the Top Kapi Museum and because uh, they were used as tribute goods. So they were the young low emperor, the Xuandi emperor, these emperor, early Ming emperors would send out, because they were so proud of porcelain, they would send porcelain out and they sent these pieces to the, to the Persian courts and they sent them to the Turkish courts. And um, uh, they're still there today in some of the collections. They still have those wonderful collections. Uh, and this one was estimated two to three hundred thousand. It brought seven hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars, which was a fabulous price. An absolutely beautiful, beautiful dish. But the quality was excellent. And um, the, one of the things I wanted to mention was was that um, um, you can. It, this one actually shows the back of it. And if you want to see what one of these should look like, this is it. And one of the things that you notice most is it's got that very, very strong iron oxide line running around it. The bottom of it is smooth, um, unglazed, you know, flashes a little bit from the heat and impurities in the clay. But be very careful because the, the makers of copies of these are getting onto this. And I've seen some with some very convincing looking backs turn up uh, in the last year. Um, a little bit frightening. Uh, but uh, pay close attention to how the foot rim is, is, is trimmed, how neatly it's trimmed, the color. And then, of course, you want to study always the, uh, the, the workmanship here, all of this work here and how they did this in the, in the drawing and the outlining and the filling in. 
All right. So anyway, it's a, just a beautiful, beautiful piece of porcelain. And then they sold this one, grapes pattern. Um, yeah, also a young low period, estimated 180 to 250,000, sold for 491 thousand dollars. And this particular pattern became an enormous favorite of the Turkish court. Uh, they were sent there as tribute, and the uh, Turkish court absolutely fell in love with these. These were sent over in the in the in the 15th century, and by the early 16th century, the uh, the, the 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 Turkish government ordered. Let's see, when was this last sold? Provenance, uh, Bijitsu, Tokyo, 1999. Um, they, 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 the Iznik kilns in, um, in Turkey, they began copying these. I actually owned one of them at one time, back 30, 40 years ago, an Iznik grapes pattern, sold it at Sotheby's, did very well. Uh, but at any rate, um, this is, the, uh, this is the, the Turkish version. This is Iznik, and I just wanted to show this to show uh, how this, uh, this interaction between these countries, um, how it worked out. The, 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 uh, the, the, the Turkish court was so thrilled with these grapes pattern plates that they began to copy them. And they copied them on the backs too, but they added too many blue circles. They went wild with the blue circles on some of these. Some of them, they didn't add any circles at all, but this one they did. Um, there it is, all right. And this is on a stoneware body. This is not on porcelain, it's on a pottery body. And uh, but but beautifully done, and, and some of them were two toned, light like this light blue, turquoise, and dark blue. All right, and that was something they did. Some plates they did just solid blue, but at any rate, this one was uh, 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 an, an enormously uh, popular. And um, let's see here, it ended up selling for four hundred and ninety one thousand dollars. So there you go. But interesting history how they were how, how the the design spread into the into across across the world into the Mediterranean, um, into Turkey. So fascinating. All right, and now on to this the, uh, the the Holden collection of snuff bottles. Overall, the snuff bottle market looks to be pretty strong with old collections. Um, and if you just glance at this page of the top row, you'll see. The seven to nine thousand dollar estimate brought twenty seven thousand. Ten to fifteen thousand brought eighteen thousand. Twenty five to thirty five thousand brought a hundred and thirteen thousand. Forty to sixty thousand brought a hundred and twenty thousand, um, and on and on and on. Now this was a collection that was 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 started back in the, I guess they started back in the sixties seventies from what I remember reading about the collector, uh, but was only bought from the very best and from the very best dealers. So you had things like this, like this this multicolored overlay snuff bottle um, uh, uh, made between 1800 and, and, and 1890, but beautiful color. The colors of the glass are just so pretty. And uh, it was estimated at 25 to 35,000 and ended up selling for 113,000. And there's a good collection uh, history on here. It was in the Holden collection. It was sold at Sotheby's November 7th in, in Honolulu, 1981. And that's when she bought it. Her active period was the 70s and the 80s. I think maybe a little bit in the late 60s. And it came from the collection of Bob Stevens, Part One, who was a very notable collector from the from the from the oh 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and uh, this was just a wonderful, wonderful bottle. And then of course there was this, the enameled imperial imperial workshop bottle, rather um, uh, done during the Chin Lung period. But uh, exceptional quality. This was the highest uh, estimated lot in wholesale, but it was done at the Imperial Workshops where they did this very fine uh, enameling and uh, beautifully done. And it looks like it's in wonderful shape, even though it's small. There's only a slight bit of wear here, but overall it looks excellent. Here's the ends of it. The ends of it are as beautiful as the fronts. Um, the, these these devices that they ran down all these vines and you see the same thing they used them on moon flasks and you see them on other on other porcelain things they're very standard four to six hundred thousand dollar estimate brought six hundred and ninety three thousand dollars for the little snuff bottle there you go and the rest of the sale did great too um, uh, the entire auction did well and I wanted to take a, just a couple of minutes to take a look at the David uh, and Nada Utterberg collection of uh, uh, Japanese um, uh, uh, calligraphy and script, and, and there was a little bit of Chinese calligraphy that was done for the Japanese market, uh, 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 Buddhist, uh, Buddhist with Buddhist connections, and uh, the, the, it was quite a sale. It was quite a sale, and overall, I have to say, it did well. There were a few lots that didn't get off the ground that didn't go, 
but a lot of lots blew through their estimates like this one um, uh, which was a Chinese uh, script and landscape done for the uh, Buddhist market and uh, ended up selling for five hundred and four thousand dollars and uh, and then there was uh, the woodblock prints um, all did uh, fine um, all the way across the board and most of them reached the upper end of their estimates or went over them um, the, the overall they did they did just just fine right straight on through but two of the couple of lots I wanted to mention in particular was this one this 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 carving by Cato Gizan he, he's a contemporary artist he was born in 1968 and you may remember we talked about two of his other sculptures that turned up um, uh, in the last couple of years and uh, they've been just such a hit with um, collectors uh, because he absolutely has his own style he has his own vision um, and here you have it. He's noted for using these metal cleats um, where the, he creates his carvings, the, the body in wood, and he creates the arms separately, and then they use iron cleats to attach them. And it's very, very masculine looking. Um, and this, this wonderful robe, very muscular uh, legs, uh, you, know, you know, muscular arms and shoulders and chest, and, um, you know, in a meditative position. And uh, it was estimated at thirty to fifty thousand. Ended up selling for two hundred and fourteen thousand. And there've been a few other pieces of his too that have gone through over the years. Um, a couple. Of, when was this? This was uh, last year. Was a, a Kato Gizan uh, a, a image of a woman seated in a chair, beautifully done, uh, with her bare breast and a, a beautiful face, lovely hair, and all that. And uh, brought eighty-seven thousand. And uh, he sold uh, this one, which is the one that many of you probably remember. Um, it was this uh, seated figure, not too dissimilar in, in general style to the one of the lady, but he's holding an arrow in his hand. And the robes here are a bit more developed. And again, you see these, uh, these uh, signatory sort of iron cleats holding the piece together. Here he did the body in three sections. So he had to cleat them together to keep it, keep it all as one thing and uh, uh, just absolutely great, great, great surface on the wood, beautifully detailed, and uh, this one sold for 312000 So Mr. Kizan's got quite a future ahead of him, I think. But the rest of the sale, the rest of the Japanese sale did great. The only thing, um, area that I saw weakness really was uh, Korean ceramics. Korean bronzes all did great. These unified silver bronzes that are always have interest in all went through their estimates, uh, but the porcelain, Whoever, whoever had the, got the porcelain into the cell, I think they got a little out over their skis and uh, pushed the estimates too hard, and they ended up tanking. Um, and I think all but just a couple uh, failed to sell. And it's be, because the, you, the sellers get greedy. Um, 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 uh, it's the worst thing that can happen if you're making a consignment uh, to an auction. I've let the audience decide how much the thing is worth. Um, if it's not worth what you think it's worth, it means you're wrong in most cases. If you're selling off a collection, um, uh, you're going to find out what that collection is worth in, 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 the, in the real world uh, uh, if you let the market tell you. All right. And nobody likes to be wrong. But, but a, lot, a lot of collectors over the years, I've noticed they, they buy things, they put things in their collections, and every year they add 10% of the value. <laughs> sort of subconsciously, they do it. And, um, and by the time they go to sell it years later, they they're often are way off on what the value is going to be. And uh, you end up with you know twenty to thirty thousand dollar estimates when the estimate should be six to nine thousand. All right. If it goes beyond that, great. But but if you're there to sell it, sell it. All right. And it's 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 like sour milk. You're putting it back in the fridge, taking it back out in a week. It's probably not going to get much better. So, just just my little comparison. All right. So that was it. That was it for the the sales that I want to talk about. Uh, overall, um, I think they did fine. Uh, given all the turbulence in the world, and I, and I think that there's still a lot of interest in rare things new to the market or not on the market for a long time, and rare things that have extensive uh, history of exhibitions and, and write-ups and so forth, like many of the pieces we saw here today do have. Uh, uh, the, when, they, when they are put up for sale, um, there's a bit of a frenzy that happens, and they get very excited about it. And uh, before you know it, you have, you have big prices. You have big, big, big prices for the best pieces. All right. Have a great rest of your week, and uh, we'll be back on Friday with the regular weekly video. And um, uh, for those who use the global pages, um, you notice that we've added, we're starting to put uh, uh, videos on there 
on the global pages, on the global home page. We, we've done just one, and we're going to do another one tomorrow. And we're going to try to do one or two videos a week minimum um, for the global page users because I think they feel maybe feel a little bit left out because we don't always have a chance to go through and uh, do the uh, sort of a detailed look at, at the end of auctions that have occurred over there and a detailed look at things that are coming up in auction and um, uh, because it, it requires some time to go through it. So we're going to do that separately from now on on the global pages. So if, if, you, if, you, if you use the global page and you like these videos, be sure to check for those because they're going to be quite similar in composition and length. So uh, there we are. So, it's a, so you, you, you're going to get an extra seven or eight videos a month, which is fine. I, I want to do it because I, I think it deserves it, and there's interesting stuff out there. So there we are. All right. Have a great weekend and a great rest of your week, and I'll be back Friday. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.